Hi, Lisa. Hi, Bibbs. Nice to see you again. Nice seeing you again as well. <laughs> And it looks like we are right at nine o'clock a.m. Pacific time. And so um, we should probably get started. I know there will be people joining um, as we go along, um, but that's all okay. Um, and I'm happy to, very happy to welcome everyone here today, um, whatever time of day it is for you. And um, it's my pleasure, actually, um, to be welcoming you all. This has been a uh, long time that we've been working on this uh, project to start the Cyanopsych, um, which is um, allowing us as a cyanobacterial research community to all come together, hopefully, um, as we're doing here at the symposium. I was really... Uh, excited to see all the different people who signed up. Um, it looks like they're from all over the world, as diverse uh, as our beloved cyanobacteria are. <laughs> um, so with that, um, I just wanted to mention that, um, let me show my screen. Um, wrong screen. Let's try a different one. There we go. So here's the um, the, the uh, schedule for today. Uh, so we're going to be starting off with a, a plenary talk by Dr. Danny Ducat, who I'll introduce in a moment. And then we'll have four um, shorter talks uh, from from a variety of uh, research directions. And we'll then have a short break before which we'll talk about more cyanopsych specific stuff. And uh, we wanted to do this to because I'm really excited about being able to share the research of cyanobacteria. I've uh, been working with cyanobacteria since 1990 when I was first introduced to an unnamed um, cyano that we now belovedly call Prochlorococcus. And um, I fell in love with, with growing them and researching them. And so after years of doing lab work, I'm now working with curating um, databases and I'm very happy to be able to introduce this um, new portal to genomes and metabolic pathways of cyanobacteria. So with that, I think I will um, introduce you to our first speaker. And um, this Danny Ducat is a uh, associate professor from Michigan State University. And he has been um, working on cyanobacteria as a biotechnology chassis um, through developing tools for genetic engineering, um, as well as uh, the syn synthetic biology applications to um, hopefully help the world. <laughs> and um, he also, though, does basic research in physiological changes and um, uh, basic photosynthesis. So he's going to talk to us about some of the research he's been doing, um, as well as introduce you more to um, how we got to this um, point of having a, a cyanopsych. So I think I will turn the screen. I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll turn it over to Danny and you can share your screen. Great. Can, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, I see some nods. All right, just let me know because uh, people tell me sometimes the microphone on this laptop is not so great. Um, I let me go ahead and share screen. Um, 
And uh, also say a, a, a huge thank you to um, Lisa. Um, and, and, and I want to say thank you not only, of course, for the opportunity to speak here today, but uh, even more so for being um, as such a, a leader in, in sort of taking oh, wow. this idea and, and bringing it to uh, fruition. So um, I think uh, that um, Lisa mentioned that uh, I would be talking just a little bit about the sort of um, the origins or how this conversation got started. Um, a, and so I know from just looking quickly through the list of people that, that are, are, are participating that a number of you were probably present uh, a, a few months back, but many of you um, I, I didn't have the pleasure of interacting with um, last summer at the uh, the 14th uh, workshop on, on cyanobacteria that was uh, hosted um, here at Michigan State. Um, and uh, uh, for me, the, the, this workshop was, um, uh, well, to give you a little bit of context, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the, the workshop on cyanobacteria is part of a decades-long series on uh, sort of international uh, cyanobacterial conferences uh, that runs once every three years, uh, and it's interspersed with two other uh, uh, cyanobacterial um, conferences or symposia uh, that uh, uh, is interdigitated uh, in order to try to uh, have one, one a year. Um, and uh, so this was the uh, topic areas in, in these, these conferences kind of range all the way from ecology and physiology uh, to photosynthesis and metabolism and engineering and even synthetic biology. Um, a, and it, and they're really they've been a really great form uh, form for um, me and my research uh, to engage with you all. Um, and I would encourage you to to take part in future ones. But for this specific uh, conference, um, uh, this was a, a conference that was pretty much my first conference coming back to in person activities after uh, quite a while of of, of COVID uh, restrictions and, and basically just having um, uh, symposia and conferences online. Um, and so one big part of the, uh, the conference was really designed to be thinking about what kinds of questions we could ask or what kinds of en engagements and interactions we could have um, uh, with everybody present that would be a little bit more difficult to, uh, to have um, uh, online. But then also a big part of the organization was thinking about what things had changed in the, the prior two years uh, that maybe we needed to address and it was something that the whole community could have some buy into. So um, uh, what uh, I, the, uh, I need to, to give a, a lot of credit um, uh, to a number of participants in the, the conference itself, um, uh, including, uh, so this is a picture, uh, uh, one of the pictures from the conference, uh, um, and actually Hamadra here in front was one of the uh, um, uh, people that I was engaged with who was, who was suggesting uh, some topic areas for uh, uh, the conference, uh, as well as I really need to give props to the executive committee that's, that's down here at, at the bottom of the screen, uh, who were integral in uh, helping to set the agenda for the conference and to think about what kinds of questions uh, were in people's minds after um, you know th this period uh, uh, during uh, COVID, um, uh, and, and one of the um, one of the concerns that had come up was that in the prior two years uh, we had really seen that some of the the resources that uh, the cyanobacterial community used for their uh, in um, bioinformatics. Um, uh, uh, were uh, no longer available. So uh, many of you might have been familiar with uh, Cyanobase, um, a, a very popular uh, online uh, um, uh, cyanobacterial bioinformatics platform um, that uh, was, uh, just a second, oh. um, was a uh, uh, contained a lot of different cyanobacterial genomes and a lot of tools for analyzing those genomes. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, the support for th that resource um, uh, uh, was through a, a, um, a Japanese institution and had waned over the years. And during that, that two-year period, um, uh, the, the resources that had once been available on, on um, a cyanobase were, were no longer available. So uh, in discussion with the executive committee and with the members of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the conference, uh, we were wondering if we could put our heads together and really talk about what sorts of uh, tools, what sorts of um, uh, things might have been lost when that resource went offline, uh, if it was possible to recover certain functionalities that, that might uh, no longer be easily accessible. 
Um, and then I think it was really also a really broader conversation about what role do we as a cyanobacterial community really need to play um, in supporting and in being a part of the discussions for how our bioinformatics uh, uh, tools are uh, developed and then maintained over time. So we had a roundtable discussion um, uh, that when I reached out to uh, Lisa in the, the, the run up to uh, this conference, she very generously agreed to not only lead the discussion here, but also to uh, sort of organize the uh, um, the attendees uh, and, and, and poll them and survey for the kinds of um, uh, functions that they might want to see in a, uh, a sign of bacterial database or things that they were concerned might have been lost uh, in um, in cyanobase when it, it went down, right? So um, you don't really need to pay any attention to any specific bullet point over here, only to just say that there, there was engagement and enthusiasm both before the conference and then actually during the discussion. And this kind of created a set of, of different um, uh, ideas that could be then nucleate a conversation um, that continued on after uh, the conference. And so uh, I, I guess I, I will say sort of a um, engaged and enthusiastic uh, um, set of, of conscientious volunteers agreed to continue on in, in conversation with Lisa and Peter Karp, um, who continued to organize meetings uh, 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 with uh, the idea in mind that, that some of these questions and some of these functionalities that the community would really like to see represented in a, uh, a sign of bacterial database could be implemented um, onto a biopsychs platform. And so again, I, I, I need to give a lot of credit to a number of the faces that are here in, in the screenshot and apologies, it's hard to get a screenshot of a Zoom uh, meeting without uh, you know some people's face not maybe being the, the perfect uh, uh, um, expression that they'd like to see. But uh, thank you very much again to Lisa, Peter, as well as to a number of the other members who uh, were uh, present for uh, these meetings over the past eight months or so, um, you know, including the pictured here, uh, Bin Long, Eric, and Devaki, John, uh, Jeff Elhai, and, and Alex. Um, a, and so I think that um, this sort of maybe sets the stage for some of the, the questions and the, the types of things that went into a, these conversations and, and thinking about how we could be developing a a platform that's really not only uh, has a high level of utility for those of you who are really deeply engaged with bioinformatics, but even something that uh, for a, a researcher like myself, who would definitely not call myself a, a, a bioinformatician, um, that, that could be accessible, um, that could be uh, easily learned um, and, and approached uh, to tackle some of the questions that, that we have as part of our research project. Um, and so, uh, I'm going to switch focus here in just a second, but I, I just kind of wanted to highlight one of the research areas that, that we had that really has benefited a lot from um, bioinformatic approaches um, and, uh, and also highlights the fact that it, even though I don't call myself a, um, you know, a bioinformatics lab, um, I think increasingly we all recognize in the field that the, uh, not only the bioinformatics tools and uh, sort of the ability to compare across different genomes, but, but then also mine the wealth of uh, cyanobacterial genomes that have been deposited is a really powerful approach for learning more about the fundamental biology of many of the processes that we want to study or engineering new, new um, um, functionalities into our cyanobacteria for, say, technological applications. So the, the project that I'm going to talk about today kind of spans across multiple different uh, groups and uh, uh, funding periods, but it really had its origin um, uh, in a uh, NSF uh, grant that um, um, my, myself and Kath, Kathy Oster-Young, my colleague here at MSU, um, initially submitted uh, with the idea of um, thinking about uh, self-organized systems in cyanobacteria um, and, and self-organizing proteins specifically that were involved in cyanobacterial division and what kind of homologs they might have in chloroplasts in higher plants uh, that could give us some insight into how the chloroplast divides and how that process is regulated in, in plant systems. So at the time, um, Josh McCready, um, a graduate student uh, sort of co-mentored between Kathy and I, was really tackling a, a number of the questions related to cyanobacterial uh, 
division systems. And this project sort of uh, expanded in scope to be looking also at other self-organizing proteins, um, including self-organizing proteins of the carboxysome. And this is where uh, the, uh, the, the collaboration really kind of expanded to include um, uh, Anthony uh, Vicarelli um, in the University of Michigan, just basically down the road from us, um, who had a lot of uh, fantastic insights and uh, uh, into the PAR, B, or PAR A systems that, that sort of uh, uh, we were studying for this process. So I don't think I need to give most of you too much of an introduction here um, on carboxysomes, but I, I wanted to just very briefly introduce the overall uh, topic for, for those of you that maybe aren't regularly thinking about carboxysomes and just remind you uh, the structure that we're talking about. Um, so across um, many, if not uh, all, cyanobacterial or most cyanobacterial species, you, you find these bacterial uh, microcompartments that are these uh, proteinaceous microcompartments that contain a protein shell um, that more or less creates an internal microenvironment uh, where all of the rubisco uh, involved in carbon fixation is housed. So you have all these shell proteins on the surface of the carboxysome that sort of uh, create a barrier and uh, dictate uh, some of the permeability properties of, of the uh, micro uh, compartments and it help to create an internal luminal environment where the rubisco is that's enriched for CO2 so that you can favor the carbox, uh, uh, carboxylation reaction and uh, discourage the oxygenation reaction or discourage the photorespiration that's occurring um, in, in these uh, bacteria. Um, in this way, uh, cyanobacteria are able to highly concentrate CO2 into this compartment and increase their, their overall efficiency of, of photosynthetic reactions. One of the really cool uh, or interesting um, uh, things that was first discovered about these carboxysomes is that they're not just randomly scattered throughout the, the cytosol. In fact, if you tag a component of the carboxysome, in this case, this is a small subunit of rubisco that is tagged, and you look at its localization in the cell, you see that it neatly lines up sort of equidistantly along the length of the, of the cyanobacteria. And this was sort of an open question as to how uh, this uh, occurred and, and what sort of mechanisms were involved in that. And that's kind of where these uh, self-organized proteins uh, that, that Kathy and Josh and I uh, were interested in started to get us into the area of thinking about how carboxysomes were organized and then pulled in uh, Anthony's group as well. So uh, this question actually has deeper roots, of course, than, than our group. Um, and uh, uh, if we sort of look uh, almost a decade or so ago now, um, uh, Dave Savage did some really great uh, pioneering work in this area, um, uh, looking at the spacing between uh, carboxysomes and basically showing that you could tag different components of the carboxysome, like the shell components or uh, subunits of rubisco, like I was just showing. You get that really nice regular spacing in the, in, in the cell. Um, but that if you knock out certain proteins in those cyanobacteria, you end up with this, this aggregation or um, clustering phenotype of the carboxysome. So now instead of having this nice regular spacing along the length of, of the cyanobacteria, you instead get these clumps that, that form either somewhere in the middle of the cyanobacteria or even clumps that sort of start to form at the pole. One of the proteins that was uh, uh, highly implicated in Dave's study uh, was this PAR-A-like protein, uh, which has since been named uh, Maintenance of Carboxysome Distribution A, uh, or MCDA, um, and uh, which Dave found can oscillate back and forth from one side of the cell to the other, right? And so uh, it kind of, if you, if you tag that MCDA, you see that it, it localizes uh, with a certain dynamics from one side of the pole and relocalizes to the other and then back again. Um, this led to a um, hypothesis about maybe how PAR A was was uh, a functioning uh, that perhaps it was creating these sort of uh, uh, microfilaments that were acting as little molecular rulers that could be spacing the uh, uh, the carboxysome separately from one another, right? So and the ruler would kind of move from one side to the other and back again to the cell. But it was it was a little bit nebulous and confusing how how this might actually occur. Uh, and this was in part, of course, because there was a different understanding of how uh, of PAR A systems work at the time. All right, so uh, uh, to fast forward a little bit, when, when Josh started to get interested in this particular question, um, he also wanted to uh, look into these oscillatory behaviors of, of MCDA or this PAR-A-like protein. Uh, he tagged uh, MCDA uh, with m neon green here, and again, could see th these types of oscillations that were being previously reported. The thing that I want to kind of draw your eye to in this figure is that 
Um, these oscillations weren't just in bulk from one side of the cell to the other. They really seemed to trace along a certain path. And if you stained the, the DNA or the nucleoid in these cyanobacteria, you saw that there was pretty close co-localization for these oscillations from one side of the cell to the other along the length of that nucleoid. Furthermore, uh, if you took a purified MCDA and you put it in the presence of nonspecific uh, regions of DNA um, and then did a DNA gel shift assay, where if the MCDA binds to the DNA, it uh, now creates a higher molecular weight. And then you see a shift up in the, uh, the uh, electrophoresis of this, this DNA in the gel. Uh, you could see that adding additional MCDA led to a higher uh, shift in, in um, uh, indicative of binding of MCA to the DNA, but really only in the presence of ATP. If there was ADP or no nucleotide present, there really wasn't much binding of MCDA. So this led to a little bit of a hypothesis that, okay, MCDA might be oscillating along the length of the nucleoid, but how does that really connect to uh, spacing of the carboxysomes and uh, what sort of other factors might be involved? Um, so uh, there's the literature in the PAR-A field is quite deep, um, and so there was a number of known PAR-B-like proteins that are known to attach to cargo. Um, and so uh, we went looking for a PAR-B-like sequence that might be, you know, acting in a, a similar uh, manner, but then helping to space uh, carboxysomes along uh, the nucleoid. Um, and uh, fortunately, or what seemed like fortunately at the time, uh, if you look through the genome of uh, Esalon goddess, you could find a nice PAR-B, uh, a very typical PAR-B uh, homolog um, that was encoded in the extra chromosomal uh, plasmid of, of Esalon goddess. However, when you knock that protein out, um, carboxysomes still had their normal uh, protein localization and MCDA really still oscillated back and forth uh, uh, you know, from one end of the cell to the other. So we went looking for other possible interacting proteins of this PAR-A, and it turned out, well, we really didn't actually have to go all that far, because if you just looked close to where MCDA was uh, encoded in the genome, um, some of the proteins that were the most suspicious uh, for this function uh, were, were encoded right near right near the MCDA. And so uh, 1834 and 1835 are two not very well characterized proteins that uh, Josh also looked at. And uh, to make a long story short here, uh, when he knocked out this uh, 1834, which we've since renamed MCDB, um, at the time it was a, uh, often characterized as a pseudogene uh, or at best a hypothetical protein in most of the, the protein databases. And it didn't really have any of the features of a PAR-B-like protein. So when you knock out uh, this MCDB, uh, uh, you know, the uh, MCDA no longer oscillates from one side of the cell to the other, uh, and instead just sort of seems to be localized to the area of the nucleoid um, in, in the cyanobacteria. How is MCDB connected to MCDA and, and, and uh, involved in, in positioning carboxysomes? Very briefly, just to show you uh, that if you knock out either MCDB here on top, or if you knock out MCDA down in the bottom, both of these lead to a disruption of that normal, nice spacing of the carboxysomes along the, the central axis of the cell. And instead you end up with clusters of carboxysomes as visualized by uh, this reporter of the small subunit of Rubisco. And that's true both for the MCDB, uh, like where you get this cluster here at the pole, or MCDA. Seeming that, that one or the other of these proteins are both necessary for this positional activity. So how could MCDB be functioning? Uh, a tagged MCDB, um, uh, when you uh, express it in the cell, uh, in this case, again, it's an m neon green tag, it has this nice localization pattern uh, in these uh, characteristic pun punta right down the center of the cell, uh, which is very uh, reminiscent of the carboxysome uh, localization pattern. And indeed, if you uh, co-express a recorder of the carboxysomes, these two things uh, nicely co-align. Uh, furthermore, you could look at some bacterial yeast or bacterial two hybrid studies uh, uh, that, sort of, that indicate that MCDB is probably interacting with one or more members of the uh, the shell proteins that coat the surface of the of the carboxysome. Uh, in addition to both interacting uh, with itself uh, as well as MCDA. So. Um, a, at this point, um, we got a little bit curious about uh, the uh, phenotype of MCDA binding to DNA only in the presence of ATP, especially uh, given the fact that uh, many PAR-A proteins, and including this MCDA homolog, uh, have a little bit of intrinsic ATPase activity. 
Um, so here in the yellow line, you see MCDA uh, uh, can hydrolyze ATP that is bound, um, uh, but that, that activity can be further enhanced when it's either in the presence of DNA or in the presence of MCDB alone. So you see a, a slight shift uh, in this, this, this kinetics uh, from the yellow line to the, the blue or, or green line here when you only have one or the other, but really you only see a significant bump up in the ATPase activity of MCDA when uh, you have both of them present. All right, so uh, again, I'm cutting corners here, uh, but I wanted to kind of tell a, a, a narrative arc over uh, more than just this story. Um, and so uh, the, the kind of the end mechanism that uh, um, we think is is uh, happening in order to position carboxysomes al along uh, the length of the cell is that uh, MCDA is creating sort of a carpet uh, or, uh, along the, the nucleoid. Uh, MCDB is bound uh, to the surface of the carboxysome and that the interaction between these two uh, uh, species or these two proteins is, is acting to position the carboxysome. And this video probably um, shows this type of mechanism uh, as best as it, it can possibly just be described. So I'll, I'll show this in lupus back a, a couple of times uh, just to get the, the message across. But the idea here is that you have kind of this carpet of DNA um, here on the bottom of the video that is coated up with the PAR A or MCDA that's in the ATP bound state. Now, we know that MCDB seems to localize to the surface of the carboxysome, sort of represented by these uh, you know, red circles uh, on, on the surface of, uh, of these two carboxysomes here in the movie, and the MCDA and MCDB interact, and that furthermore, this interaction stimulates the activity of the MCDA uh, to uh, uh, um, hydrolyze ATP, and therefore that drives the MCDA off of this local patch of uh, the, the DNA. And so what that means is that, in effect, uh, a little microenvironment uh, around each uh, um, uh, carboxysome should be relatively depleted for uh, a bound MCDA uh, on the DNA. But yet, because there is an interaction between the uh, uh, MCDA and MCDB, each carboxysome should be locally sort of looking for the highest concentration of MCDBA on the nucleoid in order to make those interaction while still creating a little depolymerization de zone around it. Uh, in a, um, it, what, what's kind of nice about, I think, this system and the, the size of the carboxysome in this particular case is that this uh, mechanism is probably conserved for many of the ways that the PAR systems are helping to uh, um, uh, segregate uh, certain um, uh, uh, molecules or, or structures to, to, different, to, to, to both daughter cells equally upon distribution is that the carboxysome is large enough that you can actually kind of catch this uh, mechanism in action uh, 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 using microscopy techniques. So what you're looking at here are uh, two, uh, uh, some, some uh, cyanobacterial cells that have been manipulated to only have two carboxysomes and where the MCDA that's bound to the nucleoid is also labeled. And so what you can see in this particular uh, time-lapse uh, series of images is that these carboxysomes, uh, this carboxysome right here starts to bud off of this other one, and, uh, and then it travels up or, or well, travels down uh, towards the higher concentration of MCDA inside the cell. And then over time, it gets further and further away from this, this uh, uh, carboxysome that it butted off uh, from. But that as it reaches a, a larger distance, the MCDA really starts to fill in behind it and create and refills that patch of, of DNA um, as such that uh, eventually this carboxysome stops. So it's sort of seeking this higher concentration of MCDA once it reaches a, a certain distance. Um, a, it's effectively a, um, sequestered far enough from the other carboxysome, and they both only uh, are sensing their local pools and not uh, uh, sort of competing or create, you know, both to depolymerizing a local zone. Um, the last little point to bring up here is that uh, I, this sort of initiated a, uh, an interest that, that Josh uh, was to carry on into his uh, postdoctoral work with his Anthony's group, where he looked a little bit more broadly and tried to uh, uh, take this mechanism and, and take it just outside of our specific model cyanobacteria and look to see how widely conserved this was ac across other uh, cyanobacterial species and other bacteria. So in this uh, last figure that I'm showing you from that paper, uh, he looked to the gliobacter um, to find an MCDB-like sequence uh, and then brought this back into a, a S. longatus and showed that it could also bind to the carboxysome. But the main thing I really want to draw your attention to here is that these MCDB proteins especially are pretty poorly conserved. 
Um, and so the homology uh, from one MCDB to the next is actually uh, really quite weak, which made it difficult in that initial study to really um, anticipate how much this MCDAB system might be conserved across other bacteria. Um, this really isn't my work. This, this occurred uh, uh, from Josh uh, when he was working in, in Anthony's lab as a postdoc, but I just want to sort of mention it because it's highly relevant to the, the bioinformatics approaches that are, are sort of the, the uh, topic of the day, uh, in that uh, Josh was really able to take both um, a, a, a broad approach uh, to uh, look for MCDB-like sequences across many different cyanobacterial and then even alpha proteobacteria uh, species uh, uh, by taking advantage of uh, kind of a neighborhood analysis of these genes. So while any one individual MCDB-like sequence is, is quite disordered and doesn't have a whole lot of homology from one sequence to the next, um, you could often step your way across the genome by looking for these uh, se uh, uh, sequences that kind of had some characteristic features of disorder and coiled coiled region, but that, that, that happened to cluster in neighborhoods of the genome that were near other uh, genes of the carboxysome. So you could see in many genomes, you find MCDB sequences near sort of the, the main carboxysome operon. Sometimes you find these MCDB sequences kind of near satellite sequences like the uh, uh, sort of ancillary uh, shell proteins of the carboxysome, or even other luminal proteins like the carbonic anhydrase that's packaged into the, the, uh, the carboxysome. Um, so before kind of closing on this topic, I, I want to bring this back to some of the other really great work that's being done in this space and, and some of the, the ways that my group is, is sort of following on. Um, and so I spent, you know, the last few minutes talking about how carboxysomes are dynamically positioned and regulated in space inside of a cell, but it's increasingly clear and, uh, that the carboxysome is also regulated in time and in context. So this is a, a figure from, uh, I, I think I saw Lu Ning Lu uh, on the call. This is a, 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 some nice really a work from his group showing that uh, in different environmental conditions, uh, and in this case, this is just um, modulating the level of light uh, on the culture, you have a pretty dramatic um, change in the carboxysome morphology from low light conditions over here, where you have a relatively few number of carboxysomes, to uh, uh, high light conditions where you have many different carboxysomes. Uh, and so both in the number and the size of these carboxysomes can be kind of uh, adjusted. Uh, and the, the uh, emerging theory is that uh, that these carboxysomes might be then uh, modulated in order to be primed to, to sort of maximize, carbox or, or, uh, maximize carbon fixation efficiency in different environmental contexts. Um, some work that's been done uh, by Amit Singh in my group um, you know, further kind of extends this idea uh, of that it's not just the environment that the uh, carboxysome is sensitive to, it's also the metabolic uh, status or the, the signals that maybe are internal uh, in, inside these cells that the carboxysome uh, is responsive to. Um, and so, as Lisa mentioned at the top, my group is very interested in thinking about cyanobacteria as a bioproduction chassis. And one of the questions we have is, is how is photosynthesis altered when you engage uh, some of these uh, heterologous pathways where you're diverting a large amount of the energy resources that the cyanobacteria is normally making and sort of pushing them into a metabolic pathway, for example, um, uh, that is just, you know, then bleeding out of the cell. So we do a lot of work with a sucrose secreting strain of cells, which is not super important for this particular talk, only to just sort of point out that Emmett has been able to see that when you export a large portion of the carbon um, from these cyanobacteria by turning on the sucrose export pathway, that you have some pretty dramatic rearrangements of the carboxysome. You see both the upregulation of the carboxysome number, uh, the carboxysome size potentially, and ultimately um, uh, uh, the total activity and abundance of rubisco. And we think that this is kind of correlated with potentially a um, a regulatory sensing system where the cyanobacteria is trying to balance its incoming uh, uh, energy from photosynthesis with the amount of, of energy that it can use for metabolism. The last person that I, I really want to call out in this context um, uh, who's doing some great work uh, is um, um, Dr. Maria Santos Marino, um, who is, is kind of, you know, working together with EMIT to ask the question of how are these uh, these uh, regulations that are occurring across time, uh, what are the mechanisms that are involved? 
I don't really have time to go into her work, um, but hopefully uh, it'll be published shortly. Uh, to very to sum it up quite quickly, um, Maria has been uh, knocking out a number of two component regulatory uh, proteins in in these cyanobacteria, looking for ones that might be involved in things like the changes that, that we see in the carboxysomes. Um, and we think that there's four uh, um, two component regulatory proteins, uh, RPAA, SICB, NBLS, and, and MANS that are really uh, implicated uh, in this process. Uh, and it might be uh, acting to connect the metabolism of the cyanobacteria together with uh, the carboxysome morphology. And I also want to call out um, uh, uh, Reese Verlema, uh, who's a graduate student in my group, who's uh, doing some related research on carboxysomes. So, I think I'm okay on time. Uh, yes, okay, I've got a couple, couple minutes left. Um, so just to summarize, um, I just wanted to sort of uh, highlight uh, one area of our research that really benefits from bioinformatic approaches, um, even though we would not specifically call ourselves, a, or I, I wouldn't call myself a, a bioinformatician. Um, and it's a really powerful method for illuminating sort of poorly understood processes. Um, so. We've been able to use that to find that MCDB or and MCDA and MCDB uh, probably have a highly conserved role in carboxysome positioning across cyanobacteria. Um, but we, we're kind of you know, expanding on this this idea um, that I, I tried to uh, quickly summarize of, of guilt by association, looking where uh, in the genome you find a specific gene and what kind of partner genes are nearby uh, in order to figure out what, uh, uh, other related functions. And so for the two projects that I very briefly touched on at the end of Amit's and Maria's, uh, I think it's going to be very integral uh, and important to use these, these types of um, informatics approaches to uh, really connect the dots and the mechanisms for how carboxysomes are being uh, regulated uh, in, across time and in different environmental contexts. But really what I want to drive uh, home with this talk is that um, a what started out as a um, kind of just a conversation um, in a, a conference uh, has led to a much bigger effort um, and that if you are somebody who is interested in bioinformatics and you're using it for your research, um, I, you know, it can be a little bit nebulous as to who's on the other side of some of these resources that are out there that you might be using for your project. And it turns out it's actually, you know, just a, a group of scientists again. And so if you want to uh, um, be involved, uh, you absolutely uh, should, you know, just raise your hand and, and maybe reach out to uh, Lisa or, or myself and, and potentially get involved in some of these meetings and, and make your voice heard about what kinds of resources you'd like to hear. Um, so, for example, at the last meeting that we had uh, um, uh, with the uh, biopsych meeting or cyanopsych meeting, um, uh, uh, Jeff Elhai um, had put together a resource for doing some of this sort of guilt by association neighborhood mapping uh, to allow you to identify other genes that would potentially be um, uh, implicated uh, uh, across different cyanobacterial genomes um, and to make that a bit more accessible um, for uh, people that don't, don't do that uh, analysis regularly. So here's my group. I've introduced a number of them already. Um, I guess the last like second or two I will take is just to say that I, I'll give a quick plug for a new uh, research uh, avenue um, that's a center uh, activity. Um, this is a center grant that was funded by DOE. It's led by Cheryl Kerfeld. That's just getting started up. Um, it, it's sort of a collaborative effort across a number of different institutions that, uh, for which the positions are available uh, sort of across the U.S. Uh, and we're really uh, looking at these bacterial microcompartments, not just the carboxysome, but you know the distribution much more broadly. Uh, the bioinformatics tools that I, I'm alluding to there uh, previously are even more important in this project and thinking about how to sort of uh, reconfigure these uh, shell components that can form these beautiful bacterial microcompartments into other systems and to make customizable um, uh, microcompartments. So with that, I will close and um, if there's any, now I'll take questions in the, the, the chat if, if anybody has them. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. And I, we do have a, a little bit of time for questions. If, if people want to um, raise your hand or just, uh, I can't see everyone. Uh, so go ahead and speak up if you have a question or write it in the chat. Well, I will say that I 
really enjoyed um, all the images. <laughs> and I mean, it's beautiful work and beautiful work done with microscopy as well as with the bioinformatics. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you very much. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. So I'm wondering about, have you tried to kind of quantify what the equal partitioning of the carboxysomes would mean in terms of fluxes of carbon into the cell or something like that? I mean, intuitively, it makes sense that if they're more or less organized the same distances, that would maximize um, carbon dioxide uptake or, or something along those lines, but they also need to be partitioned close to the photosynthetic apparatus. Have you kind of looked at that in terms of cell organization and maximization of fluxes or transfer times or minimization of transfer times? Yeah, so I, I think the question, and, and if I don't catch it all, because the sound was cutting in and out a little bit on my end, um, I feel free to follow up in the chat. But I think the question was basically, have we tried to, to uh, correlate the positional system with any sort of um, uh, carbon fixation efficiency, right? And whether, you know, and I would say that um, I, that both some some really great work has been done by uh, Rees Rilemma uh, and Anthony's group, um, uh, you know, begins to get at this question and shows that um, in particular, when you lose these positional systems under, you know, in, you know, non-lab environments, you, you do have a fitness loss. Um, but this is something that we really hope to follow on and, and get a little bit more in detail, sort of applying some of the um, ACI curve like technology to cyanobacteria in order to look in systems that are compromised for the positional system or, or are compromised for specific cyanobacterial, um, you know, components. Uh, to get a bit more quantitative estimates of exactly how that impacts um, carbon fixation rates in different uh, um, inorganic carbon um, uh, availability. Looks like we have um, another uh, question. Somebody raised their hand. Uh, tai Siok Moon. Apologize if I mispronounced your name. Uh, it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful yes. talk, Danny. Uh, my question is more from my perspective. And I'm an engineer, uh, bioengineer. So, but your talk is very interesting, fundamental understanding of the system. But from my perspective, you know, I see in the cyanobacteria or even any photosynthetic organism for something potentially solve climate problem by taking CO2 and so on. So my question is, I want to hear your future perspective regarding that application. And, and then I want to hear from you about that. Yeah, no, I, it's a it's a great question, and I I would have loved to pontificate it uh, on it at a little bit more length, but I I didn't think I could cram it all in. Um, I think um, there's sort of two ways that uh, we specifically, and, not, and I'm not saying that these are are all the ways that you could imagine, you know, moving forward in a more um, uh, biotechnology uh, mindset uh, from from. Uh, the carboxysome uh, work and, and micro compartments. One is on the side of, well, if the carboxysome really can be modulated in order to improve um, the total amount of, of CO2 that's fixed under these kind of artificial conditions where we're exporting sucrose, is it possible that we can figure out those mechanisms uh, that are a bit more fundamental, but then apply them more generally, right, to any other product that you might want to make so that you could always have that higher level of CO2 fixation? Uh, and then I think that the more ambitious uh, uh, questions are that if you really understand the assembly properties of these bacterial like, micro compartments broadly writ, um, and you know kind of how they gate, uh, um, you know, what metabolites can go in and out of them, um, you can start to think about uh, making a micro compartment that has the right number and the right composition of shell proteins so that it's, it's going to allow your substrates and products in and out of the, the compartment. You can begin to think about these as either scaffolds or, you know, fully encapsulated, um, you know, nano compartments to do whatever chemistry you'd like. Um, and and that, that's probably, you know, along the lines of what you're thinking, uh, but I don't want to take up too much more time um, and, and uh, get us too far off track in timing. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much.